gentlemen, please be standing for the chair and vice chair of council. Guy was a Harlow boy, born and bred. He grew up in a new town, uh, a town he loved to cherish, and a town that he lived in all his life. He was born into a working family and aspired to improve his life and that of his family, a characteristic that moulded his politics. After leaving school, he found employment in London. After working there for a good many years, he found himself, like some of us, redundant and <coughs> came back to Harlow to work. As an example of his public spiritedness, he spent a year training to become a magistrate and served for many years on the local bench outside of Harlow. He also went to work for the border agency at Centred Airport. Guy was a people person, always interested in what you had to say, always courteous, always polite, had time for a chat and to listen to your problems, which of course was excellent training for a politician. His love of the town and desire to improve the town moved him into politics at, a, at an early age, and he was a councillor for the old ward of Kingsmore in his early 20s. But after losing his seat, he remained an active member <coughs> of the Conservative Party. He preferred working in the background contributing ideas for the leaflets that he delivered by the hundred and thousand. Mentoring new candidates, usually to a successful event, even if it was only by two votes. He worked tirelessly with and for our then prospective and then eventual MP Rob Calthorn, helping him champion the town that Guy loved. He came forward again in 2009 when he was elected to Harlow West County Council. And having got the bug, he was elected the following year to this council for his home ward of Staple Tide, where he worked assiduously on behalf of his residents, taking up their individual issues and lobbying hard to get improvements and road improvements. He always appeared fit and healthy to us, so it was a shock early last year when he suffered a stroke. And then we were all very relieved when he uh, began to recover from that. <coughs> We're, but it was even more of a shock when the diagnosis of cancer came a few months ago. And then he contracted pneumonia and passed away peacefully in Princess Edmund Hospital last Friday. We have lost a dear friend, a respected friend, a friend of principle and integrity friend who embodied the idea of service to others above self, a friend who has gone before his time. Our thoughts and prayers are with his family. Thank you. Councillor 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Can I first of all um, uh, address uh, the family, because I, I do hope we are having this filmed and I do hope we can give some comfort uh, to the family in the coming weeks and coming months. Uh, so this is a personal message from the Labour Administration, from all councillors, senior officers, staff and all our partners. Collectively, we send our greatest sympathy and our empathy to you in these very challenging times. And you do have good friends around you, so please make use of them, because Guy was a great politician, but he was also a great son and a great brother to his brothers and sisters. Uh, Chairman, as you know, uh, Guy, we, we all know him, and I think everybody in this chamber has had the pleasure of listening to Guy when he was in full throttle and full throw. <laughs> I, I honestly believe he didn't actually like frontline politics. He didn't actually, he loved politi being a politician, but he didn't actually like being in here and debating. I know personally, because when he took my Harlow West seat off me, we did have a lot of conversation, and I was actually pleased to get it back from someone else shortly afterwards. But actually, both me and him had long conversations at Essex County Council. And actually, his passion, his drive, his love was Harlow. It wasn't in Chelmsford. So I can well understand and well appreciate the amount, a uh, massive amount of work that he did for the, uh, uh, the Tory party. And I know that he was the driver behind, with Russell and a couple of other people, uh, regrettably, I have to say, to getting us a Tory MP. But it actually, it was his determination by what he was doing and how he was doing it that made that difference at that particular uh, time. I think most people in this chamber will remember the famous budget debate mm -hmm. when he actually decided to turn his response into a pantomime mm -hmm. where he made amazing quotes uh, and amazing gestures mm -hmm. and actually, to be honest with you, put us all into shame and shock uh, about his fluidity and his expertise in these particular areas. Um, Guy was always deeply, deeply committed to Harlow. As Simon quite rightly says, if you cut him, it would say Harlow through him. And I remember having a conversation with him, and I always was uh, amazed because when we were growing up, we used to have um, footballers on our bedroom uh, windows and doors and walls. I swear to God, uh, he had Mrs Thatcher because he really did truly and honestly believe that she should have been sainted for what she did. And she was the driver and motivator that brought him into this particular area. Guy's a passion like my passion and Russell's passion was around regeneration. And I know that we spent uh, a number of hours uh, discussing fiercely about what we thought that should be happening uh, to the town over these. And I have to say, me and him had some long debates in this chamber and in other committees. But what the great thing is, he may well have destroyed you in the argument and you really felt deflated. But then when he looked across at him, he actually just gave you that wink that he did. Because he had the humanity. He never took that personally. He never took that. And actually, he was the first person outside the door that would actually put his hand around your shoulder or say something that actually made you feel that you were part of it. There was one uh, an occasion which is about Perrin's pots. And the reason why we didn't realise how huge those damn pots were going to be was because me and Guy were on the same committee. And me and him got into this stupid debate now about what should we do with the playground. And for some mad reason, Guy Mitchison had this idea that we needed a galleon. This big ship that kids could play and climb on and stuff like that. Where he got that idea from, I have absolutely no idea, but he was absolutely adamant about it. So I had to take the opposite. So I wanted an airport, because with Stansted, EasyJet, I just thought marketing it would be really good. Now, I don't know if it was Russell or the notorious naughty Cathy Shaw, but actually what we ended up with was that he got a rowing boat and I got a plane. So I thought I'd done quite well on the deal, because at least I'd got a plane, and I think he was a bit gutted that he'd got the rowing boat. Ironically, the next week, my plane, one of the wings fell off. <laughs> and I remember dreading having to meet Guy again, because it would be something that he would remember, and he did remind me on a regular basis. But he was a true gentleman. Uh, he was a true Harlow person. He was a true advocate and a true pioneer. 
His ambition uh, is our collective ambition, which is to make Harlow the best we possibly can for everybody at any particular time. His DNA is actually our DNA, and many of the ideas that he was putting up around regeneration stays with us, and it will always be a mark of respect for him over these particular ones. So whilst he was a great blue Tory, he was also a great Turu friend. And I have to say that whilst we all will miss Guy, he will never, ever be forgotten. Thank you very much. Thank you. We return then to the main agenda. Apologies for absence. Uh, the government wants to see local planning authorities producing their own plans so that communities, business and others can benefit from the certainty that having a plan can provide. We have to find a way to make sure that we have that coverage throughout the country. The bill would enable the Secretary of State to invite a county council to prepare a plan for a district authority in its area. I made it clear during the Commons Committee stage of the bill that it is not our intention to make regular use of this power. It would only be used if a local planning authority is failing to prepare or review its plan, despite being given every opportunity to do so. The measure complements the Secretary of State's existing powers to invite the Mayor or a combined authority to prepare a plan for an authority. The power would provide a more local alternative to the Secretary of State intervening more directly. You have suggested that district councils should be allowed to seek peer support to prepare a plan where they have not made progress with the plan themselves. This is an option already open to authorities, and I would encourage those struggling to prepare a plan to seek the advice and support of their peers where this is available. Additionally, we have put targeted support in place through the Local Government Association's Planning Advisory Service. Finally, thank you for drawing my attention to how some of the language in the bill has been received by district councils. I will reflect on the points you have made. Applications from the chair, chairman. I would like at this point just to ask members please to have the courtesy to other members during the debate not to fiddle with their iPads, iPhones, etc. But above all, not to talk to each other because members talking among themselves drowns out the person who's speaking and there are a number of people in the public area, and having given up their time to come and hear our debate, I think we should give them every chance to be able to hear it. Um, the other thing is, I have attended a number of events this uh, period since the last council. They can range from going to the Maybury Open Door, uh, food bank distribution centre that is, to welcoming the High Sheriff today when she came, and that was a very pleasant visit, and I'm sure she was very pleased with it. Um, the only other event I would mention is opening the new cinema. Mm -hmm. A real asset that is going to be for this town with its six screens, and the film was great, and I can thoroughly recommend it. It's a really nice place to go. I believe for the opening of Star Wars, they are fully booked, but as time goes on, perhaps we can all manage to go along and see it. Thank you. Harlow residents are being consulted on proposals to build new homes in the town centre. The leader has stated in the chamber that no new social housing will be built in the near future. Can the leader advise what percentage of the new homes in the town centre will be for people on the council's waiting list? <coughs> so my remarks about social housing specifically related to, council house, to the council building houses, following several governments' complete reversal on commitments around rent levels and the negative effect that had on the housing revenue account's 30-year business plan. Despite this, the council is, is actively exploring alternative funding arrangements to build council houses at some point in the future. In terms of the plans for the town centre that Addington Capital are consulting on, while the council's policy is that 35% of major developments should be affordable, recent government, central government changes to viability rules limit the council's ability to insist on set percentages of affordable and social housing. At the present time, the council does not know the percentage of homes that will be affordable and available to people from Harlow's housing list. The percentage of affordable housing will be discussed and agreed during the planning process. However, it is a it is the affordable housing provider in consultation with the housing department that will nominate people from the waiting list. What steps 
is the administration taking to ensure that any social housing built will contain people on the waiting list of Harlow and not outside of Harlow as has occurred in the development of Terminus House and Redstone House and the failure to ensure the social housing approved for phase two of Rank House. So Mr Howard mentions um, Terminus House and Redstone House. Um, both of those were converted from office accommodation to, to housing under what's called permitted development rights. Uh, and under those terms, um, Harlow Council has absolutely no say in the conversion or, or the use that those are, are put to. In terms of um, other housing developments that are, that are subject to planning, we, we have always um, tried to insist on attempting to social housing. Uh, and where a social housing provider, usually a housing association, uh, is the um, manager and, and provider of that housing <coughs> development, uh, we are in negotiation, always have been, and, and usually we get allocations from, from the housing list, but it's not in the, under Harlow Council's direct control. What steps is the council taking to ensure that bus service is provided throughout Harlow, as well as to and from Harlow, are provided more frequently and with a greater variety of routes in order to provide better coverage for all areas of Harlow? <coughs> So following the deregulation of bus services by central government some years ago, Harlow Council has no direct input or control with regards to bus services in Harlow and beyond. Operators run services on a commercial basis with any vulnerable services operated under the direction of Essex County Council. Obviously the member of the bus users group the council does of course involve itself in the quality of bus provision in Harlow. Thank you. I fully realise that the council do not control bus services, but surely in any, reading, any local plan there should be an attempt to avoid the massive duplication of some services at the expense of others. Uh, the, the local plan will absolutely address um, a variety of uh, transport issues, whether that's infrastructure or, or the provision of public transport. But, but I can only repeat what I said about uh, the deregulation of, of bus services. Um, we can uh, advise, we can uh, seek to influence through, through the bus uh, users forum, but we can't insist. Uh, we can't centrally um, plan or, or control bus services in Harlow or anywhere else. I wish that wasn't the case. I've been coming to most of the council meetings concerning the square. In the last one, all the councillors were asked if they were in favour of helping to save the square. The answer was a unanimous yes. A vast amount of time has passed and the club is on the verge of closing. The square has been a great influence on my life as well as others. It's a place where people from all ages, all backgrounds and all ethnicities can come together for one purpose. To enjoy music. Many events for young people happen at the square, such as the live wire band, rock school and the future of the next generation's music. This isn't a lie. Some of you may know of Pixie Lott. She is a great, great influence in the music industry. She started off as a rock school member here in Harlow, which takes place at the square. Our generation is glued to our phones. But the one thing that can take us out of one world and into another is music. Therefore, I'd like to ask what the council have been doing in order to help save the square. So Harlow Council has worked actively with the Square and Circle Housing Group, now Clarion Housing Group, to try and identify suitable alternative accommodation for the venue. A number of buildings have been reviewed, some owned by the Council and some in private ownership. Unfortunately, as a result of many different factors, the Square management did not feel that they were suitable or meet their aspirations, either because of location, size, financial viability or a combination of all three of these issues, and options for the relocation are extremely limited. One such proposal involved co-locating in the Playhouse with independent studies undertaken to evaluate how this might work in practice. However, the Square felt this proposal was unsuitable and its conversion was not financially viable. During 2016, two further meetings have taken place between the Council and the representatives of the Square, the first being in late spring 2016, following which the Council made arrangements for representatives from Northwick and Waveney Enterprise Services to provide support to the Square to develop its business plan. 
Council has also discussed the benefits of the square changing its company structure so it can attract other funding streams and grants currently not available to the company. This is for the square to pursue and not something the Council should provide any further support towards. <coughs> a second meeting place took, it, took place in October following the appeal decision and the Council actively challenged the owners of the site, Circle Clarion <coughs> Housing, on behalf of the square regarding comments made by the planning inspector at the appeal of the planning decision specifically in relation to the support offered to help the venue relocate. At that meeting, the Square did advise that a suitable new location had been identified, albeit one that had been previously rejected, but required funding to upgrade parts of the building. We are waiting the Square management getting back with specific proposals and then exploring possible sources of funding. Once the Square management have decided what their preferred course of action is and the support they are looking for from the Council, this of course will be taken into consideration. But there are obviously limits on the level of any financial support that the Council could give, both in terms of the significant year-on-year -year central government cuts to Council funding and the legal constraint on the Council providing financial support to privately owned and operated organisations. We, we will do what we can to work with other groups and organisations so the Square does regrettably decide not to continue. We will not lose a legacy around new music that inspires young people. Where on earth will I now go to um, help flourish my music career? Well, so I know that the Rock School um, at, you know, has a premise off, off Hare Street um, and will um, you know, is looking for a place to expand. But I, I, I genuinely don't know what uh, the Square Management want to do. I've had many discussions with, with different parties that there are differences of opinion around that and we will try and support them. But, but if uh, in the event that uh, the Square Reversary does close, because they decide to do so, then we will actively explore other avenues um, to make sure that people like yourself uh, and, and new musicians, I've you know, listened to the Rock School uh, perform on many occasions, uh, both in the town park and, uh, and elsewhere, uh, to make sure that there is a place uh, where young talent can be developed. Thank you. Questions from councillors? There are none. Motions from councillors? I believe you're one Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I've heard it said that a person judges his town by the ten yards outside his front door. Indulge me as I take you a little bit further than that to judge one aspect of Harlow, our roads and highway infrastructure, as I describe the walk from my home to this chamber tonight, a distance of 1.1 miles. It starts on the green of Ty Green Village, where there's a children's playground, outside of which there are safety railings to prevent children running directly into the road. Railings are so badly damaged, so many rails are missing, that a child could run through the gap straight out into the road. It offers no safety. It's simply a dangerous eyesore. And it's been like that for years. As I turn the corner into Tawny's Road, I see the first of the 34 potholes I'll pass on my short journey, not deep enough to qualify as a priority in the eyes of Essex County Council Highways, but certainly both wide enough and deep enough to cause damage to the tyres and rims of cars and to put their tracking out. I also notice cars speeding. Do you know there is not one speed restriction sign on this half-mile stretch of residential road with a school in it between the Poplar Kitten and the Mini Roundabouts? As I pass that school, William Martin, I remember the child who was hurt crossing the road by the school nine months ago, which together with weekly reports from parents of near misses, prompted the local community to raise a petition calling for Essex County Council to investigate traffic calming measures. To date, not a single speed limit sign or other measure has been installed. And despite vague promises of action, possibly, after April next year, maybe, the situation has become more dangerous with the loss of the crossing attendant. At the end of Tawny's Road are two mini roundabouts. The first has six potholes, so does the second. Again, these potholes aren't a metre across, but they are big enough to need avoiding. And there are six of them, on each, and they're only little roundabouts. <laughs> then we carry on along Tripton Road, past the first stump of a lamppost, one of four on my walk cut down years ago, but neither repaired nor replaced. They are warning, danger tape, discoloured and frayed with age, a danger not attended to. Then on past the bus stop outside St Mark's School, with its own little shoal of unfilled potholes, to the roundabout where Tripton Road joins 2nd Avenue. 
Here I see three chevron direction markers, every one damaged and bent. One in such bad shape the support post had rusted completely through, so that the sign hangs crooked and scarcely visible to the drivers it's meant to guide. Bear with me, I'm nearly here. <laughs> Just one more big roundabout to go. Here the direction chevrons are built into the brickwork that surrounds the roundabout. But dozens of these bricks have become loose, have fallen out, and periodically end up in the carriageway, presenting a clear danger to motorists. The road structure in Harlow is in a dreadful state. Vehicles are being damaged. Motorists and pedestrians are inconvenienced. And it's no exaggeration to say, put in danger. And the response of Conservative Control at Essex County Council, and I have personal experience of this, is to classify potholes as not being a priority, and therefore not to attend to them. To leave damaged signage unrepaired, and to kick essential road safety schemes into the long grass. Meanwhile, the Conservative Councillor responsible for highways congratulates himself in the local press for a job well done. I'm sure I have the support of Labour councillors in sending a clear message to the Tories in Essex that their complacent approach to maintaining our highways is simply not good enough. But I rather hope that the opposition parties will join us in demanding that the Conservatives in Essex, who are letting us down so badly, get a grip and rectify the problems. Councillor Long has indicated in the press he's been campaigning for action for years. Well, here's your chance, Dan, to vote for improvements in Harlow rather than siding with the Tories as you usually do. Yeah. And perhaps the opposition will put party political posturing aside for once and join us in demanding that their Conservative colleagues in Essex take their responsibility seriously. After all, over the last week, in meetings in this very room, Conservative councillors David Carter, Joel Carr, Charles and others from that side have voiced concerns that a lack of tidiness gives a poor impression of our town and suggested a litter pit. My Labour colleagues are happy to contribute and to encourage community groups to take part in a spring clean harbour in the early part of next year to restore some civic pride. But I'm sure the councillors opposite will agree with us that whilst picking up a crisp packet or soft drinks can, carelessly discarded at the foot of a broken and rusted lamppost stump immediately adjacent to a potholed road beside some rusted signage as laudable, it misses the point. And that what's really needed to help restore some civic pride is adequate and urgent investment by Essex County Council in the infrastructure of Harlow's roads. I move the motion. Madam Chairman, thank you for this uh, personal clarification. I'd just like to point out that Councillor Carter and I were talking about cross-party talks and Councillor Eagle knows that about tidying up and litter picking in the town. No, it's a cross-party action, it's not party political, and I like that reflected that it's about creating pride in our town, getting all the political parties together and not political points for it. Tonight is a very sombre mood. I'm very disappointed that Council England has gone down that road. <laughs> Thank you. I congratulate Mark on his excellent yeah. first speech and uh, I hope to hear very many more. And I endorse his comments. If we want to work together, let's actually have some pride in the town and actually have all of these things uh, clarified and clear. Just outside the fire station, at the last highways yeah. panel, yeah. there was uh, a, a request to the chair of the panel to actually take his, because he can do this, to actually just get that roundabout sorted out. It's an absolute disgrace. If we have pride in the town, we need the whole town looking, looking good. Chaos on our roads for years to come. Not my words, Chair, but my answer from Councillor Johnson at County Hall last year at the highway seminar that we actually had for the county councillors and district councillors. And why was that? Because he talked about one road scheme after another, after another, with a certain amount of pride. And when asked why, why, in fact, these things aren't going out to tender, he didn't really, he simply said that um, uh, Jacobs was their, their, their approved um, uh, contractor, and he was reliant on, on them. I was suggesting weekend working, I was suggesting evening working, stopping the delays on Harlow's roads. Um, 
and speeding up all of these things. We hardly see any work being done on many of these projects. They're very lax. And the moment they fall behind, what goes up on the sign? Oh, they change the date. Was spring, now it's summer when it's going to actually uh, finish. And then he says, when it comes down to the Queen's Gate roundabout, which is the worst roundabout on the third row, Absolutely. it has no intention. He has no intention of doing anything with that roundabout whatsoever, which is quite crazy because that's the roundabout that actually needs uh, to, to actually uh, be, be taken in hand to actually hold the, the, the amount of hold-ups that we actually have <coughs> in, our, in our roads. Increasingly, there is an embarrassment in terms of it almost becoming uh, like a third world country in terms of looking at our pavements. And like Mark, walking here tonight, in fact, I, I, I was very embarrassed with the downs, the state of the pavements and so on, and the crying out for attention like so many uh, of our states. And when we ask for it, we're told that they're okay, they're fine, they're third world conditions, they, they meet all the criteria. I, I made that last bit up. They don't use third world, but they, they have some kind of criteria. <laughs> Occasionally, the person in charge does listen because he actually had the, 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 uh, the uh, traffic lights on the bus, bus lane bike turned off on 2nd Avenue at our request at the highways panel. He listened to us and he, he got them turned off and to his credit he had them taken down and the traffic speeds up wonderfully well. All I wish is that Councillor Eddie Johnson 1 was here tonight because I'm only quoting what he's actually said in public. I haven't actually said anything else that he hasn't made uh, in the public meeting um, to, to defend himself. But secondly, if it goes into that listening mood, if the message can actually go out by whatever means tonight to actually tell him we are dissatisfied, we expect better, and he could use his powers to things like that small roundabout, he, he could decide that. The roundabout that the people in Orton Grove, that was within his gift of the highways panel, and he refused to do that. He could have done it, but he refused to do it. And in those circumstances, I really think that we have somebody in this town who actually represents Essex and needs to really get his act together. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Amanda Chairman. And uh, Eddie's asked me to pass on his apologies for this evening. As Councillor Downham, as being a county councillor well knows, Eddie had a, a knee replacement on uh, Friday of last week. Um, and that's the reason he's not in the chamber. He, he, the council now makes it sound like he's chosen not to turn up tonight, but uh, a major operation has, has prevented him from being here. That being said, Councillor Johnson Senior does know that Councillor Dambers is never happy with what Essex County Council is doing, and is very conscious that this motion tonight is nothing more than simple electioneering, given that we have county council elections next year. Now, I'm not going to tell you that Harlow's roads are perfect, we all, know we, we, all, we all know they're not, but I do want to be a bit serious about what has been happening around town. Thank you, Ian, for that interruption. Uh, I do want to be serious about what's actually gone on, because the, the BBC have recently named Essex one of the best county councils in the country for um, uh, dealing with potholes and dealing with road defects. They're the only council to do an annual scanner survey, as well as the, the, the web surveys that people are allowed to do. Looking at um, the actual local network, um, they are, there are 117 local network miles in Harlow. Now, that's out of 3,109 across the whole county. So, Harlow Council has, Harlow District Council has 3.8% of the county's yeah. network it's roads. Usage, including yeah. country roads. It's yes. Usage, yeah, which yeah. I began. Chairman, you asked us at the start of, the, of, of this debate not to speak. My group have done that, but your group continue to do it. Yes, please do not interrupt. In May 2016, on those 117 network miles, there were 598 defects. As at the end of November 2016, that's down to 481 defects. That's a net reduction of 117, or a reduction of 20% of defects. Across the county, there were 5,011 down to 4,037. That's a reduction of 974, or 19%. Harlow getting more than its fair share. But if you actually look at our 3.8% of roads, 117 reductions uh, in, in that period against the 974 county wide means that 12% of all network road defect reductions were in Harlow. That's Harlow getting more than its fair share. On priority one roads, we had 60% of the reduction across the county. 
On PR2 roads, we had 66% against a 42% reduction on counting. Now, this motion, Councillor Danvers seems to talk about um, ma major road network piano in a way. That's not what this motion is actually about, Councillor Danvers. You've asked for three things. The immediate prioritising of road repairs to residential streets when you know that Essex County Council is purposely prioritising PR1s and PR2s, reducing the number of PR1 defects in Harlow from 24 to 12, and the number of PR2 defects from 12 to 4, one of the best in the, in the, in the whole county. So you know that you're asking for something the county are not going to do when they're trying to keep the major road networks flowing. Secondly, you ask for the timely commencement of traffic calming schemes. Um, as you well know, in the last two years, there have not been any major traffic calming schemes that have come before the Highways Panel, the local Highways Panel, on which members of your group sit that have not been turned down. They've all been agreed by the, and prioritised by the Highways Panel, which includes members of your own group. The third thing you're asking for is ensuring that the allocation of road repair budget reflects the higher density. Now, I, I would ask, how much do you actually want of the road budget? 12% of local network repairs across the county have been in Harlow. 16% of PR1 repairs uh, across the county have been in Harlow. And 4.4% of PR2 road repairs have been in Harlow. Looking at curbs and pavements, there is a £9 million budget at Essex this year for the repairs of, of footpaths across the county. That's across the 12 districts in the, in, in the county, 12 district areas in the, in the county. Now, a fair share of each of that would be 750k per council. Harlow this year is getting £1.3 million pounds of that £9 million. That's a very sizable chunk above its weight. Essex County Council has not spent as much money on roads and road defects in Harlow um, in, in, as in recent years. Up until there was, there's never been a, a Conservative Cabinet member up until Eddie on uh, Essex County Council. Mm -hmm. And Harlow, in, in years gone by, I've criticised Essex for treating Harlow like a backwater. When I was leader of this council, I used to go up against Lord Hanningfield all the time and say he was treating Harlow as a backwater. And, and I will do. And up. not dealing with, with, with Harlow's problems. Since Eddie has become the, the cabinet member for, for highways, Harlow has got its fair share. Yeah. Harlow has got more than its fair share. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, it always surprised me. I, I welcome uh, uh, Councillor Ingalls' uh, first speech. It's nice to hear him speak eventually. And uh, when, when he talks of when he talks of a cross-party consensus, it always comes it always comes with the um, the Tory bashing with that. And I wonder how many people he ever gets to work with him whilst at the same time uh, having a go at them in the process. It seems a very odd way of trying to build consensus, in my opinion. Councillor Johnson's laid out the facts tonight and points out quite clearly that Harlow is getting more than its fair share in terms of uh, budget allocations and etc. If Mr Ingle, on his walk um, to the, uh, the council chamber, would once in a while walk into local news agents and actually read a newspaper and find out that the reason the country doesn't have a lot of money is perhaps because a lot of it was wasted in previous years, it would make you realise that the small <laughs> budget there is, the fact that we're getting a lion's share of that, um, is tribute to Councillor Johnson. And I learned tonight that the number of roads in, in Essex outnumber those in Northern Ireland. The fact that we have um, a council which goes out and regularly surveys the roads uh, in a number of ways, and he's actually rated as one of the best councils in the country for repairing roads, I think there's something to be lauded. As Councillor Johnson rightly points out, the roads aren't perfect, and there is more to be done. But it's very easy to be negative and to tear down what Councillor Johnson is doing in this regard. We've never had a Cabinet member at County um, before. The Cabinet member is putting Harlow um, front and centre now. The roads are being repaired and replaced. And I think, rather than looking always at the negative, if he wants to build consensus, he might actually start looking at some of the positive also that comes to this motion. Is the amount of times, forget about me as a councillor, me as a resident of Arlo, I've put forward to Essex County Council about potholes that need repairing, mm -hmm. and I've been told, oh, it'll take two weeks. Five years later, they're still sitting there. <laughs> so I want to know, how comes, their policy is two years, <coughs> but when it comes to, say, certain areas of Arlo, they seem to, but that seems to be their policy, but certain areas get overlooked. And you know, we all pay our way when it comes to road maintenance, and we all pay our way when it comes to the paving and the footpaths and that. So surely, if they're going to start when it comes to repairing our roads, if they're going to 
put one area of Arlo first or prioritise, then you know, what I want to know is why is it that that's the case when we all pay the same rates towards Essex County Council through our council tax? Right? And if I want to play football golf, I'll go and play football golf. I don't need to do it out there on the main roads. So I'm well, I'd like to congratulate Councillor Johnson on his mathematics, <clears throat> but unfortunately he's not in touch with reality because as he almost implied himself, the question of the length of roads is irrelevant to the uh, actual amount that needs to be spent on them uh, in order to keep them in order. There's a number of factors that lead to deterioration uh, of a road surface and unfortunately all of those factors score very highly uh, in Harlow. Prior to um, the county taking over responsibility for roads in Essex, Harlow Urban District Council was itself the highway authority and with all other urban districts and, and borough councils in Essex, they had developed their own uh, spend that was necessary to satisfy their residents. When Essex took over, um, the uh, slowly over the years they tried to standardise everything and not recognise that there was a difference between different councils, council areas. But I just want to refer to the factors that lead to deteriorating in roads. One is obviously the volume of traffic and particularly the, the volume of heavy traffic. Cars themselves don't actually have much effect on the structure of a road, but heavy vehicles do. And obviously in Harlow we have a large number of heavy vehicles travelling around. You can go to parks of Essex and you could sit and go to sleep in the middle of the road. There wouldn't be a car pass for hours. And those roads, believe it or not, there was, the funding mechanism was changed for maintenance. So that actually each, road, each mile of road gets the same allocation of maintenance funding irrelevant as to how busy they are. The other factors that uh, affect the deterioration of roads is the number of times they're dug up for public utilities. Because every time the surface of a road is broken, yeah. it's broken just like a rip in your Mac. It all, then we'll let the water in, and then you'll start to get deterioration in the trenches and potholes and so on. And of course, again, Harlow, the roads are always being dug up, because we always need new services for new facilities. The last point I want to make, which is about the future because obviously we're complaining at the moment about the, de the potholes, the deterioration we can see at the moment. <clears throat> There's a long-term problem in Harlow which the county will not address. And I've raised it with them many times and even produced a plan, uh, a, a PPI plan actually, as much as they're discredited. Um, there is a, a reason for it and that is the structure of the main avenues in Harlow. They were built some 60 years ago and they are normally designed to last 40 years. In that time, they've not only gone 50% over their design life, but they take much heavier traffic now than they were ever designed for. And that's why whenever they're surfaced, it's lovely for about a year, and then all cracks start appearing. That's because underneath, all the roads are rocking and cracking. The structure of the roads is deteriorating considerably. Now we're going to be faced with a situation at a certain point where all those roads are going to fail at the same time and we're going to be in chaos. We need to address that problem before we get to that stage. Unfortunately, the county refused to discuss it. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> I just want to say one of the comments that Councillor Johnson mentioned that um, we as Labour councillors haven't put in safety improvement um, request forms. I for one have. I think you did say that. No, 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 no. I, I said that no safety recommendation has been put forward to the panel had been refused. That's not quite the same for making But still, I've put in a number of requests. One of them is for the William Martin School that um, Councillor Ingle mentioned, and it's been over a year now since anything's happened. Yeah. Yeah.
thank you, Chair. Um, I think the point of this motion and one of the frustrations I think I get from a lot of residents, different people in Harlow, is that I think everyone understands that the priority one and priority two, that main roads, you know, should be really important. It's really important our main junctions, our main arteries throughout Essex are flowing. And I don't, I don't disagree, and I understand the pressures that Essex County Council is under. <coughs> there is a unique point of view in Harlow in terms of our residential roads with estates of 500 houses on that do become main link roads in Harlow effectively, even though that it's classified not as priority one or two, but have heavy, heavy usage. More heavy usage than some of the priority roads in some of the more um, outreach parts of Essex. Um, and to do with the de understanding the density of cars that go across these places um, and the residential streets. And I think that's what's really important to understand. So I will be supporting this motion. I think that's really important. I think Essex doesn't always quite understand that. Um, and I think that's one of the points to say, and that the speed of things that are put forward. Also, I'd just like to veer off really quickly, um, Chair. I'm not going to make a habit too much speaking this council when I feel the, when I feel my colleagues are disrespected, but I will tonight again. Is that every single person in this chamber should feel welcome to contribute? Every single person here has been elected. It may take people different lengths of time to speak. There's people opposite me that I have seen, I haven't seen speak before council, but I know contribute to committees and different things. And I feel Councillor Perry, your remark was very disrespectful to Councillor Ingle. He's a new councillor that's been involved for six months. I welcome, you know, he said, and it's shame taking so long, there was a sideways stick. And that's unwelcome, it's against the spirit of this chamber. This can be a very dominating and very hard place to break yes, through. I and I don't feel this, well, I'm sorry, Chair, but I was allowed to speak after three minutes. And actually, I don't feel appropriate. Everyone should be welcome to speak. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to make two points. The first one being that um, a few years ago, Carter's Mead was resurfaced, pavements road. And we hadn't actually finished the project, which was supposed to be five years, but it took about six or seven. And then Morrison came along, and a lot of the, the bottom end where I am, was completely dug up the pavements and part of the road and they did piping along the, the middle section. They actually put the, sur the whole surface back down, but they did a better job than Essex had done. But that meant that the Essex money that had been used for that whole project was wasted when Morrison came along and actually resurfaced the pavements and part of that road. So the, the, the utility companies and the Essex <coughs> have got to get together more than they have been so that weight money <coughs> on both sides is not wasted. Now, we haven't had snow and ice this winter so far, thank goodness, but I'm thinking of the potholes we've got in the, in the roads that the elderly and family units have got to cross. When it's snowed and when you've got ice, they don't know where the potholes are, but they're hidden. But some, a lot of people are going to have accidents if these potholes are not covered properly, not just emergency cover, but total cover, because there's going to be accidents with the elderly and families uh, they don't deserve. Chair, they're going I to end up with reflect on a couple of points that have been debated this evening. I think forefront in all councillors' minds is road safety. And it's forefront, obviously, in Councillor Eddie, John, uh, uh, Eddie Johnson's mind. He is the lead portfolio holder in Essex, as we know, and he has consistently said that road safety is his priority and is the priority of Essex County Council. What is important is the amount of investment that Essex County Council are putting into roads in general. 300 million over the next three years. In the financial year between 2016 and 17, 137 million have been ploughed into the roads across Essex. And as Councillor Andrew Johnson has said, <coughs> the investment Harlow has secured as a result of the work of Councillor Eddie Johnson, we are unique in Holland that we've got the portfolio holder here, he listens, and has said consistently also in the press mm -hmm. that potholes, cracks in pavements are his priority, and he has been chatting that at Council Hall. So I think that's important to recognise. No councillor who holds a portfolio as important as highways is ever complacent. And I think that's quite wrong of the administration to say that. You only have to look at the amount of investment that is going into Harlow as a result of county funding. For example, the 8414 First Avenue work that will be that is currently under under construction, five million. The Enterprise Zone Access Road in my own ward in Old Harlow, five million under construction. You've also got the 8414 Edinburgh Way work that is about to begin, ten million investing in Harlow. So actually, 
What Councillor Eddie Johnson does for this town is get key infrastructure funding to improve our roads. As Ad Councillor Andrew Johnson has said, we are getting, we're punching a problem <coughs> in terms of the amount of potholes that are actually being um, resurfaced, about 20%, far more than the average across other authorities across Essex. The bottom line on this debate is that because of the work of Councillor Eddie Johnson, Harlow is actually getting its road network into a far better state than other neighbouring authorities in Essex. And for that, this whole council should be congratulating him for that. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bryant. Adam Chairman, excuse me, I'm up, sorry. Let me first congratulate Councillor Ingalls on getting this motion. <coughs> um, I will be supporting the motion. I think it is very important that the roads of our town are put in a condition that they should be. My colleague here does a lot of work trying to get potholes and other road problems sorted. The only thing that, to me, spoils it is that we are only five months away from the new county elections and this administration decides now to bring this motion to the chamber. And I don't like to think that it's for political reasons, but on this occasion, <laughs> I must say, it seems that that's exactly what it is. Otherwise, we would have had this debate <coughs> at least 18 months ago and we've got things moving. So it's a great motion and I thank Councillor Ingalls for bringing it. I will be supporting it, but it's a shame that our county councillors hadn't brought it forward on an earlier basis. Thank you, Chair. Like a number of colleagues, I also welcome the, uh, the, the motion from Councillor Eagle. Uh, picking up on what Bill's just said, um, Mark has been absolutely consistent with the tire tireless work that he's been doing uh, in, in Bush Fair, not only since he became elected, but also in the run-up and in the campaign to become elected, in terms of identifying the key issues in the Bush Fair ward and working alongside me to tackle those issues in a meaningful way. I'd also like to uh, pay credit to not only him, but also to uh, the three uh, Labour County councillors who have been taking forward casework from both Mark and myself in relation to potholes, traffic calming measures uh, and the like to actually try to break, make a breakthrough and get things done. Um, there, there, there is plenty of evidence to, to actually back that up and if anyone wants me to supply them with that evidence I'd be more than happy um, to, to do so. But I think that we've got distracted. If we're actually going to do something meaningful uh, in terms of this motion and with the cameras actually here tonight, we need to go a little bit further in trying to explain to the people that we speak to on the doorstep why we have a perpetual problem in Harlow with potholes, which do get fixed, but never in a serious and meaningful way. Where we can have one pothole that is a certain size, that will get fixed, and there will be three or four that are marginally smaller, adjacent to it, that won't. So a vehicle has come all the way from Chelmsford with all of the gear to fix that big one that suddenly become big enough, but we're going to leave the small ones until they are bigger, because that's what the policy actually says. And when you stand and explain <coughs> that, and when you actually say, this is the response that we get as caseworkers on your behalf. It doesn't matter how much money you say county is spending on roads and infrastructure. It means diddly swap to the people of Harlem. So what we need to be taking from this motion is the opportunity to say, we are being shortchanged by Essex County Council. They have an opportunity to do something about it and they have to account to the people of Harlem. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Is anybody else wishing to speak? In that case, Councillor Ingram, do you wish to sum up? I do. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, firstly, I'm flattered Councillor Perry has been waiting so anxiously for me to come to you. I'll try very hard not to frustrate you in that way in the future. Uh, but I would like to pick up on a couple of your points. You spoke about consensus. It's difficult to reach consensus where only one in three of my emails has been responded to. It's difficult to reach consensus when you report a pothole to be told but that pothole was reported three months ago and it's only 86 centimetres across, it's not a metre. And you say, well, it's more than a metre now, but there seems to be no allowance for the possibility of potholes getting worse in Essex County Council. Very difficult. You mentioned um, a lack of money. Could I remind you that six years ago, when the Conservatives took over in Westminster, they inherited the fifth biggest economy in the world? A growing economy. And every year since then, we've heard the Conservatives congratulate their Chancellors on the success that they've achieved in growing their economy. So if there isn't enough money in Essex, I suggest Essex County Councillors go back to Westminster and say, you're so successful, give us a bit more, because the problem needs addressing. Clearly, I haven't made my figures clear. Let me summarise. What I saw tonight was a total of 34 unfilled potholes, four stumps of lampposts, three damaged chevrons, two pothole mini roundabouts, and a major roundabout in dangerous disrepair. And no, despite appearances, it doesn't make me feel with tidings of good cheer. All that in a walk of 1.1 miles. Harlow has 151 miles of adopted highway, and I'm going to use Eddie Johnson's own figures here. An eight-year-old could be expected to estimate from the figures on my walk tonight that that means there are about four and a half thousand unfilled potholes in Harlow. And as the road I chose is by no means the worst, it's likely to be far more than that. Not to mention the hazard and eyesore of broken street furniture and the serious delays to essential road traffic schemes. Waterhouse Moor Residents Association tell me they've waited a year to see the results of a speed survey on Tendring Road. A year just to be given some results. And as I said in my speech, the portfolio holder at Essex County Council, responsible for our roads, dares to congratulate himself in the local press for having reduced by September, and I quote, the total number of potholes across Essex by a piddling 357 a totally inadequate appreciation of the size of the problems we face. Although Essex County Council don't count anything less than a metre across and two inches deep as being a pothole. I suppose it's easy to be smug about success when you simply ignore the majority of the problem. Conservative run Essex County Council highways are neglecting the roads of this town and it's not good enough. Conservative run Essex County Council highways are costing motorists in this town money and it's not good enough. Conservative run Essex County Council highways are endangering the safety and well-being of our residents and it's not good enough. How much do we want, Mr Johnson? Enough to make our roads fit to drive on and safe for pedestrians and motorists. It's time we all, regardless of party, sent the Tories in Essex a strong and urgent message. Fix our roads. I urge you all to support the motion.
think that I should be able to mention the possibility of what those changes may have been since 2014. As discussed in a previous special council.
across parties, sorry, um, <laughs> and talking to the residents about what they want the future of the town to contain. When we do that and we work together, when we've talked about Crossrail and we brought that motion and you, you agreed with us, when we talk about the regeneration of the town and we agree we are a very powerful town and we start to move people's opinions nationally. What I don't want, Madam Chairman, is a local plan to go out for consultation that no one actually gets to speak on because we're constrained by the Regulation 19 process. I would like to see a full and open dialogue with our public about the sites that are being brought forward in the draft local plan, and I agree with you, tonight is not the night to talk about those sites, but it's the night to talk about can we talk about those sites in future in the consultation. And that, Madam Chairman, is why we've moved this motion tonight. It's not an attempt to frustrate, it's not an attempt to delay. We had genuine concerns on this site, and I think the Leader of the Council has picked up at that at the last few Cabinet meetings with some of the questions that we've asked, some of the, what he's accused me of stunts. have not been. They've been about getting proper consultation on the table and fully understanding the implications of the draft local plan for this town. I care passionately about this town. I know members on the other side care passionately about this town too. So please, let's have a full and open consultation. Yeah. Anybody else, Regis? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. As uh, Pastor Johnson has said, we are reaching a very important milestone in developing the emerging local plan. It's called emerging, uh, right up until the time it's adopted just a, a, a strange planning term. <clears throat> we will be coming back to the council shortly with a final version of the local plan. The local plan includes not only development options, spatial sites, but it also includes details of plans for highways and transport schemes, uh, the um, protection of the environment, the development management policies that the Council uh, will follow, and uh, many other technical issues that have been the work of the <coughs> local plan panel that's been meeting um, continually uh, over a long period in order to bring this process to fruition. And of course the Council made its overall policy clear <coughs> at the last council meeting, special council meeting, where we had a very full debate and the council made its decisions by votes, some of them recorded. Of course this plan is only final when we've actually adopted it, in the sense that it's complete at that time. The any local plan is constantly under review. In fact, after it's adopted, the review process will probably start quite quickly because you need, you know, if you like to, to use modern uh, standards that weren't available when the plan was produced, and you need to review the way things develop. There's always changes in social or technical trends which need to be looked at in relation to the local plan. So it's only final in the sense that it's complete at the time for submission to an inspector and thereafter it will be continually be able to be reviewed. But at this late stage in the process towards submission of our local plan, the party opposite wants to turn the whole process into reverse to reconsult on issues that are essential for Harlow to achieve our objectives for the future. Now, this <coughs> Regulation 19 uh, consultation it is a consultation, it's not a box ticking. I mean, when Councillor Johnson talks about box ticking, these uh, technical uh, reports that are part of the local plan are important in their own right because they refer to the environment in this town in, its, in, in all its aspects. And <clears throat> they're not just box ticking, as if, you know, they're, they're totally uh, irrelevant. They are relevant to the future of this town. And that Regulation 19 uh, consultation enables all those issues to be challenged, 
uh, as far as the site, which is really what the party opposite wants to get stuck into, is challenging the individual sites. Well, the fact is, we, whatever sites were, are in the local plan, they have to meet the objective needs that are stipulated by the government. We don't decide how many dwellings we need to provide. They are actually, the numbers are supplied to us and, and uh, through a process of duty to cooperate with our neighbouring authorities, <coughs> we have to, we are allocated a certain number which we have to fulfil. We have to have this local plan submitted by spring 2017. We have to get on with Regulation 19 uh, consultation. If we start turning the clock backwards, and if you like going back, probably at least 18 months, which is what we would be doing in the process, we are never going to achieve the target date that the government itself has told all local, local authorities they must meet. If we don't meet that date, then it's quite likely, as we've discussed in this chamber, not so long ago, the implications of us not meeting that date is that the government will step in and appoint somebody to produce a local plan for Harlow over our heads and we'd have to pay for it. Well done, I don't see anybody else indicate. Oh, yes, Gav. So, so this motion is being framed as being a reopening a full and open consultation. Of course, there's no such thing. It's simply kicking difficult decisions into the long grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's adding significant delay and adding risk. It's adding risk that the housing levels go up, will go up in the meantime. Yeah. Um, putting increasing government pressure to build on our green spaces. It's adding risk that we'll have funding withdrawn. I received a letter today from the housing minister about the new homes bonus, something that uh, the party opposite go on about uh, incessantly uh, as if it was a replacement for uh, massive funding cuts. But I'll cut out a very brief passage from it. From, 19, from 2018 to 19, the government will consider withdrawing new homes bonus from local authorities that are not planning effectively by making positive decisions on planning applications and delivering housing growth. But the biggest risk is that this will be taken out of our hands. Now, at the last council meeting we had, uh, the party opposite refused to support the motion that would effectively um, allow the county council to impose a local plan on Harlow and charge Harlow for the privilege of doing so. Now I can assure you that Essex County Council won't have the, the same passion for the given principles in Harlow, for the, the green spaces um, that, that we have. This is motion is just about delay. They have a history of putting off difficult decisions, leaving it to somebody else. There will be an open consultation on a local plan. We need to get on with it. Because if we don't, it will be done to us. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The fundamental point of the motion that Andrew and I have put forward tonight is a crucial and very risky um, set of circumstances that have arisen now when it comes to our local plan. We all recognise that we, as a community, with our neighbouring local authorities, have to set out a clear vision within our respective local plans and follow the principles of duty to cooperate. Now, where Councillor Pern is right is yes, our current local plan is an emerging plan and strategy. And our thoughts in 2014 were just emerging thoughts about the local plan. But we set forth on a consultation exercise in 2014 to get people's views. As Andrew said, only 120 uh, people, mostly developers, responded to that consultation. So we don't have an accurate picture of what residents believe about the current um, proposals that are before us um, and have been debated as special council, and they must be considered now. Now, of course, council, the portfolio holder, Councillor Perth, has said that things evolved over decades and years, and of course, things evolved after just two years. And we've seen that in the debate that we had at Special Council. Two years on from the 2014 consultation, a lot has changed. Uh, the position of the Council towards the South and West development, and of course my big concern, the development to the North East of Harlem, the prospects of that. 
Now, because of those radical changes, I believe that residents need to have a clear dialogue with this council and councillors over the local plan, because they should be able to take ownership of it too. Now, Special Council did take a clear view um, for the administration and councillors, but where has there been the consultation, the adequate consultation with residents on the emerging thoughts in just the last year alone? There hasn't been. Regulation 19, now I took on board what the portfolio holder and the leader has said about Regulation 19, both at Cabinet last week and now at full council. But they full well know that the legislation and the way that it is worded is very prescriptive about the process. And it tightly defines that any consultation under regula Regulation 19 can purely be about the mechanisms that have um, been added together to produce a local plan. It's not about actually giving the opportunity for residents, as we all want to see, under a Regulation 18, for there to be debate with residents about the emerging strategy. Now, the administration has talked about the fact that we're now late in the day and we can't invoke a Regulation 18. Well, I have to say that Epping, Council, uh, Epping Forest District Council are going down the route of having a Regulation 18 consultation. So they are actually actively engaging with their residents about the plans that have been performed because there have been lots of changes and that needs to be recognised. This, um, this opposition is certainly not kicking this decision into the long grass by producing this motion. We all want to see a local plan that is robust for the next few decades ahead of us. But if we are not serious about actually engaging our residents in the design of the local plan, that we run the risk of there being controversies down the line. Now there are some very dramatic plans that have been set out also on highways and infrastructure that also need to be discussed by residents and have been talked about in Cabinet. And I think residents would like to have a say about that. I know the Civic Society are very interested in those proposals. The leader of the council has said that Essex County Council is in the business of imposing stuff. Well, what we found with Council Johnson's work on highways, and what we have found historically in planning processes, is that they actually have been supportive of local authorities in these sorts of matters. And they recognise the local difficulties that can often arise, and they're trying to be supportive. Fundamentally, this motion is about bringing back accountability on the local plan, ensuring residents have a say in this process, recognising the fundamental changes that have arisen since the 2014 consultation. This administration owes residents the duty of care over the consultation and the future of our, our planning and development over the decades ahead. If we miss this opportunity, I fear we will get in trouble. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Johnson, do you wish to Madam Chair, I was hoping we'd have a much bigger debate than this tonight. Uh, more members of the administration spoke on um, roads and highways and a political uh, party election broadcast tonight and have spoken about whether or not we should be consulting on our local plan. That, as we've all said, is, is about housing, is about infrastructure, is about the future of the town for the next 30 years. And actually, I'm, I'm quite disappointed we haven't had uh, as many interventions from the, from the administration. Um, <laughs> this isn't party political. This isn't about delaying. Councillor Perlman seems to think that um, it's a problem that we want to go out and consult the local so residents. Um, Councillor, Councillor Danvers, yeah. uh, sorry, Councillor Perlman and Councillor Klebner seem more concerned with the fact that they've delayed the process and the timetable so far that now they haven't got enough time to go out and do a proper yeah. consultation. I refer the members to 2014. <coughs> and as part of this process, our Statement of Community Involvement, which lays out what we should do for the planning process to involve the members of the community, where we say that one or more drafts of the DPD would be produced, published, and consulted on. We had one draft published in 2014 that was, con that was consulted on. As we all know, it was a very poor consultation. The draft has continued to emerge since then, and yet, despite our statement, of community involvement, we have not had a further consultation. That is all we're looking for. If this council continues down the route that it's planning to, under a section 19 regulation, <coughs> then what's going to happen 
is, yes, there's some very important boxes to be ticked, as Councillor Burton says, but they will just be ticking the boxes. Residents will be very frustrated, residents will be very upset, and I think the plan will risk its very being as being unsound um, because of the lack of consultation. Um, the Labour Party talks a very good story about consultation, but yet again, when it comes to it, they're not willing to actually do the consultation. I think that's very sad. Uh, and I would try and persuade members to vote for this motion. Right, we move to the vote. All those in favour of the motion, please show. Mm -hmm. Against? Any abstentions? Motion falls. There are five referrals from other uh, committees, and I would like to take an arm block. Is everybody happy with that? Yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. Can we accept the uh, referrals? Yes, Chair. <coughs> and finally, minutes from other committee meetings. Oh, of course, Ross is now. <laughs> Minutes from other committees, just for noting, yes? Yeah. Yeah. In that case, no matter for business.